It looks like we're at the uh, half hour mark here. Um, I think we're good to dive in. Um, so I actually don't have the um, uh, text that we're supposed to have to read off. Um, Rob, do you happen to have that in front of you? The, the be respectful right of each other text and such. I do. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, of course, we, we welcome everybody. That's very natural. That's a normal thing to do. And this is um, the last session. Um, uh, and the official title is, I'm not sure, I don't have that right in front of me. What's our official title? It's, uh, it's uh, about platforms and citizen science and building trust. Ah. Got it. Assuring trust on community science, biodiversity platforms, policies, and approaches. Yes. We can tag team this up pieces together. <laughs> um, Libby, Peter, and I have been working together over the last year on this, having regular meetings about um, development of uh, citizen science and biodiversity data, and particularly uh, working with Peter on the PPSR core and where that should go. It's, uh, it's a group of us and anybody who wanted to join those meetings is more than welcome to. Uh, once in a while, we've, we've touched base with some, some of you like uh, Greg Newman and his group. Um, um, the, the session is being recorded. You, I, hopefully you all got a message on your screen to that effect. And so you can view it later and recommend it to others. Um, and we thank you all for joining the standard uh, the standard time is 10 minutes, but since we only have four speakers, let's uh, try to go for 15 minutes. And um, if for some reason somebody finishes in less time than that, we, we can certainly entertain questions about that presentation. And if uh, people go the full time, then we can um, uh, entertain questions in, in the time after the hour that we have allotted for these four speakers. Um, there are, there are uh, there's a Q&A feature um, or the chat you can use. Um, and um, uh, we wanna thank, thank uh, the University of Florida and the folks there for providing the technical um, help that has been essential in making the, the meeting work. Um, so we'll, we'll thank you again at the end, but infrastructure, as we all know, is, is critical to making things work. So it's, it's worth two thanks. Take it away, Libby. Oh, no, thank you, Rob. That was um, exactly what we needed here. And I'll just let everybody know that, yes, you could put questions in the chat here in Zoom, although if you put them over in the Whova app or site, um, then they can be they'll live there forever and uh, kind of allows us to um, document this more, um, more carefully. So please put your questions there as well. Or if you put them here in Zoom, I'll just transfer them over. So if you don't have Google open, that's fine too. So that's, we'll be kind of um, keeping an eye on both of those. And we do have time at the end for some questions. So as Rob mentioned, um, um, depending on how long the talks take throughout, we can also address things at the end. And while I have everybody's attention here, I just want to mention, um, that the citizen science interest group that, um, as Rob mentioned, um, meets regularly, him, myself, and Peter Brenton in particular, um, uh, meet weekly to discuss all things um, Tadwig Citizen Science Interest Groupy, and we have a workshop planned, and it will happen in about a month from now on November 18th. So um, that is um, listed on the calendar of events for things, I believe. So you'll see that I have it as one to three Pacific time. So that would be four o'clock Eastern United or Eastern, yeah, Eastern United States and um, I won't even take a shot at the, the other time zones that are, are possible for fear of getting them wrong or certainty of getting them wrong. So um, just uh, if you could mark your calendars for the 18th, that'll give us more time or that time is slotted to allow us to get deeper into some of the discussion topics that you'll hear from today um, through our speakers. So um, yeah, and, and as Rob said, please feel free to um, become more involved with the interest group if you are so inclined and, and reach out to us to do so. 
I, I think that's all I've got. So um, if we would like to jump into our first speaker then, um, that is Emily. So Emily, feel free to share your screen and take it away when you're ready. Thank you. Yep. Um, okay. Is that all right? That's the main screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that looks great, thanks. Okay. Um, so yeah, thank you to Rob and Libby for inviting me to speak here today. Um, I'm Emily and I'm a PhD student based um, at Durham in the northeast of England uh, and I'm going to be chatting to you today about a review that we carried out examining how ecological citizen science data are verified. So just a bit of background, um, ecological citizen science schemes are growing and the volume of data being collected through these schemes is increasing. And obviously this data is a fantastic resource for ecological research, but a common theme that pops up that limits the use of these data sets is concerns around data quality and uncertainty and species records therefore need to be validated and verified to ensure that the data is of a known quality. And the process of verification is just when records are checked after submission to ensure that they're correct. And we want this process to be efficient, uh, but still needs to address these issues of data quality and ensure that the data that's being collected is accurate. So the aims of this review were to assess current trends in verification approaches which are used by citizen science schemes whose data feature specifically in published research. And we also wanted to explore the citizen science scheme attributes that might impact the choice of verification approach and look into the information that was used to verify records. And we wanted to do this to identify the options available for verification and ask whether schemes are choosing and using the most suitable verification approach or does the process of verification need to evolve to meet the needs of the schemes as they grow. And we carried out typical systematic literature search and from the relevant papers we extracted the schemes whose data feature in those publications um, and then did searches on those schemes to get information on what verification approach they used as well as various scheme attributes such as geographical scale, volunteer number, duration and whether evidence such as photos or videos was provided when submitting the record. So the search yielded 259 schemes, which encompassed a range of schemes from small scale regional projects to global scale initiatives. And for a large proportion of these schemes, we didn't find any information on verification. And there's several reasons behind this. Many didn't have online platforms. So the only information I had was what was in the paper and others maybe just didn't have that information publicly available. Um, but just because there was no information doesn't mean verification didn't happen but I do think there probably needs to be transparency with verification approaches for citizen science data and then where information on verification was available 118 of these relied on experts to verify records um, and examples of these include a lot of the UK species monitoring schemes that submit their records to MBN which is a large open access repository for citizen science data in the UK. And then 24 used what we called community consensus approaches. So where species or records were posted onto a website or a forum, and then other volunteers within the scheme verified those records. And then 14 used some kind of automated approach, but um, never in isolation and always alongside either community consensus or expert verification. And examples of this included eBird or Project Feeder Watch. So in our analysis, we firstly wanted to explore what scheme attributes might influence whether verification information was found or not. Um, and to do this, we did a binary logistic regression, um, including the main effects of geographic scale, participant number, record number, data type um, and scheme duration. And the best performing model included data type and uh, number of records. And 
scheme duration. Um, and this graph just summarizes those results, suggesting that uh, for verification information was less likely to be found for older schemes, schemes with fewer records, um, and schemes that don't require photos or videos to be submitted with uh, records. And then our second line of analysis for schemes where we did find verification information, we asked which attributes of the schemes might influence the approach that was used. And to assess this, we did a multinomial regression and the best performing model included data type and participant number. And the analysis suggested that automated approaches are used for schemes with more participants. Community approaches are more common for schemes with more participants um, and where evidence was available. And expert approaches are more common in schemes with fewer top participants. So I think we concluded from these results that expert verification has perhaps been the default approach for many schemes so far, which makes sense as community consensus and automated approaches do have technological requirements that have only emerged in recent decades, but that doesn't necessarily mean that expert verification is still the most suitable approach for some schemes. Um, expert verification does have a high accuracy um, and therefore may be a more suitable approach to obtain the level of data quality required for published research outputs. But for many schemes, every record requires expert verification, um, which is obviously time consuming. And if there's a lack of taxonomic or regional experts, that can lead to gaps in the data. Um, and there can often be a significant time lag between the verification um, or between the submission of records, sorry, and the verification of records. And it's likely that we'll probably always need expert verification to a certain extent, but as schemes grow and the volume of data being collected through these schemes is increasing, there's certainly an argument for moving away from relying solely on expert verification and considering community and automated approaches more widely. Um, community consensus approaches are an effective way of crowdsourcing verification. However, these approaches do need an online platform to connect recorders with verifiers and also benefit from having a larger number of participants. Um, and community consensus approaches, I think are generally more suitable for species that are widely recognized by members of the public. Um, automation is more flexible uh, and we can implement these approaches retrospectively uh, to schemes with large quantities of historical data, which we can use to inform algorithms or develop filters for the data sets. Um, but these approaches do require time, effort and resources to go into researching and developing these approaches so that they have appropriate rules for verification and increase the efficiency of verification without leading to classification errors. So considering the options available for verification and the attributes that might contribute to the choice of verification approach, we outlined um, a hierarchical system for verification, which we consider as the data that can be used to verify records, where automated and community approaches could be implemented and when expert verification might still be required. So when verifying records, schemes should aim to consider the breadth of information available and make use of the data that accompanies each record and we categorize this information into uh, attributes of the species itself, the environmental context of the observation, and the recorder who submitted that observation. Um, and this information could be obtained from the record itself, but we could also use secondary metadata, such as historical data recorded through the scheme or even external data sets if they're available. And in this system, we suggest that the bulk of records be verified by automated or community approaches. And then if these approaches cannot verify records with an appropriate level of certainty, experts can then provide additional levels of verification. And we outline this approach purely as a sort of guide or outline. And 
it's important for schemes to decide on their required level of certainty, which could vary depending on the species or the purpose for which the data will be used. And for most schemes, a proportion of the data will ultimately need to be referred to experts. And we think this additional verification is likely to be required for species that have perhaps not been recorded through the scheme before, for rarer species or for species that have perhaps been recorded beyond their typical range or habitat. And then if there's schemes that are focusing exclusively on those kinds of species, then expert verification might be the only appropriate approach. But I think by developing uh, improved comprehensive approaches to verification and using the full range of information available, um, we can hopefully address issues of data quality within citizen science data sets and increase trust in these data sets and further like strengthen the place of citizen science within ecological research. So thank you for your attention. Um, I'd just like to thank my co-authors um, and if you'd like to read the full review um, the reference is there or you can access it using this QR code. So thank you very much. Thanks so much Emily that was great. Um, uh, I think we could jump right into Peter's at this point, unless there, I don't see any pressing questions in the, um, in Whova or in um, Zoom here. So looking at the time, maybe we'll jump right into Peter's. Thank okay, you. Can I just share? Oops, got the wrong screen, sorry. Let me try the right screen. <laughs> Sorry, it uh, seems to have been. Is that loading? We see the screen, but it's the one with your thumbnail. So maybe once you present it, I'll go into the full screen. Oh, Not sure why that's uh, taking its time. Ah, uh, there it is. Ah, got it. Great. Looks good. Is that in presenter or? Yes, we uh, see the right slide. Okay, good, good. Sorry about that. No okay, thank you. Um, thanks, Emily. That was uh, that was a really. That's actually a really important piece of work and um, uh, it dovetails quite nicely with um, I'm about to talk about, uh, which is cloud-based software platforms um, and the implications and opportunities for biodiversity standards. So whilst uh, what I'll cover is um, some characteristics and variability in citizen science projects, um, they give a little bit of a synopsis. Um, which I don't know, may or may not be a little bit controversial, but um, it, uh, it, the main aim with this uh, synopsis is to pick out some key differences and similarities uh, between different platforms and, um, uh, and, and then we'll look at what, some, what platforms can do to improve trust and, and quality in citizen science data. So where Emily's uh, uh, talked a lot about um, uh, processes and um, sort of uh, mechanisms sort of once once data is collected to actually um, improve trust we'll look at what platforms can actually do so we all know about iNaturalist as a, um, a major global platform um, we've been talking about it and it's um, it's very well known. It's got good processes in place uh, within the platform. It is a record centric system. And uh, what I've found, and uh, I know uh, Greg and Brandon have found as well as um, and, and many others have found is that uh, citizen science are actually you know, projects that are actually very variable. Um, this is just a small selection of some of the um, hundreds of projects that we're supporting in Australia. Um, 
some that are open to the public uh, for, for making record level observations, um, covering a, a whole range of different factors um, and, and often with covariate information. So not just records of, um, of observations of species, but actually including covariate information within um, those observations as well. Um, and uh, they, they range from, um, you know, sort of bushfire work to um, um, roadkill and entanglements and um, die back in trees uh, due to insect attack, um, transect based surveys and, uh, and nesting surveys, significant trees um, and, and uh, predation on turtles and a whole whole range of different things. We've also got a whole set of projects that um, uh, are membership only. So um, they're still citizen science projects, but um, they're, they're actually um, have a, a level of participation uh, by invitation or by uh, membership of the projects. Um, and um, you know, they, they range from sort of community, local community based uh, initiatives to um, quite rigorous method based uh, approaches and, and so on schools um, with uh, and school groups as, in, as, as a sort of um, subset of, of members that's not open to the public. Um, and we've also got projects that um, are collecting samples, whether it's scat samples or um, uh, DNA or materials for DNA analysis. So they're quite broad ranging. And we need platform support for these. So looking across some different um, sort of models of, of uh, platforms that exist, I've just pulled out a few that I know as, uh, you know, exist as, as sort of well-known or well-used platforms across the world and tried to, to sort of look at how they're structured and how the data is organized within these platforms. Um, I don't claim that it's actually, uh, th this analysis is perfect, but um, it's just a general sort of overview of how these sort of platforms are organized. So th there's a model where um, platforms have fixed data schemas and a single project. So, um, it's basically a, a singular project with a, a fixed schema that has a data model and produces records. Lots of records produce a data set. And generally the metadata is combined into the project model. So they're all, um, the, the metadata that describes the data sets actually part of the, the project definition. Another kind of model that's out there is, uh, is where platforms have variable data schemas and sometimes fixed data schemas, um, but they can actually support many projects. <clears throat> and um, the data set descriptors are still part of the descriptions of the projects. The, they'll have um, essentially a one-to-one -one relationship between a single schema and the project. And again, it produces multiple records that um, comprise a data set. Um, then there's a model where you've got a variable platform with many projects, with many surveys, and the data set metadata is described at the survey level and they produce many records which produce a data set. So <clears throat> just looking across these different platforms, they op some operate globally, some operate regionally or nationally um, and, and span different parts of the world. Um, <clears throat> some of them are proprietary, some of them are more open and uh, and some of them uh, operate on a commercial basis and others not. So um, <clears throat> just looking at the categorizations, 
many project many of these these applications actually um, support multiple projects. Many of them do have um, flexible data schemas, um, but some are some are fixed data schemas only, and um, that can be limiting for the um, the range of projects that they can support. Many, many of the systems only support record um, level data, record level submissions. So um, <clears throat> uh, what I mean by that is that um, an observation of a thing, um, collecting whatever information about that thing um, is submitted as a single record. Um, whereas event structures actually allow you to record multiple records in the context of a visit to a place. And, um, and there's not very many systems that actually cover that kind of concept. In terms of standards compliance, um, many of the platforms that exist actually don't apply uh, Darwin Core or even any particular standard. Um, they may, may apply some um, uh, geospatial standards if they're spatially capable, um, but often don't um, have any compliance with existing standards. <clears throat> and even less so with metadata uh, standard schemas. And then in terms of how they share the information, many of them don't actually share uh, information, uh, the, the data directly with aggregators such as uh, uh, MBN or ALA um, or FinBIF or, or um, uh, GBIF. And um, so implications for this, I'm oh, sorry, I'll cover this one as well. So there's also digitization platforms. So Zooniverse, Digivol, uh, Notes from Nature, which is a project within Zooniverse um, also as um, sort of levels of um, different levels of compliance with standards and and um, different degrees of sharing. So looking at at um, I guess at the project level, this is uh, you know, a value of standards um, where. We have a, a model called, um, or a standard called PPSR Core, which uh, I know Brandon will speak about shortly. And uh, that is currently underpinning uh, sharing of project level information between uh, project search catalogs around the world and, um, and uh, some of the various platforms uh, so that project inf projects can be discoverable across different um, uh, the different platforms. And that's just a, a view of size data uh, in the US with uh, some of the Australian projects coming from our BioCollect platform. There's a lot of uh, challenges, as Emily has mentioned. Uh, trust and credibility are still really significant issues. They are improving. There are, are um, uh, various things being applied, uh, both within projects uh, and within platforms to improve um, the trust and credibility. But um, often also there is also uh, there is um, uh, credibility issues that uh, can arise through a lack of sharing of data and a lack of use of standards. So some things that um, that people look for in downstream in, in uh, reuse of data from projects. Um, they want to know where it's come from and how it was collected and sort of methodologies and equipment and so on that's been used, um, who collected it and how accurate it is, what sort of processes and validation uh, mechanisms have been used to, um, to, to sort of create and manage that data. Um, they also are looking for, for information about biases and conditions on use and, and how to reference and cite the information for the uh, data sources. And quite often with citizen science data, um, if they don't know these things, they won't use the data. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad data. It's just that they, they can't use it because they don't know how to 
how to treat it or, or whether it's credible for the sort of uh, research they're doing. At the record level, um, things around uh, information around accuracy and precision at, at uh, different attributes. So within taxonomic information, have think, uh, have, how confident are we in the identification of a particular species within a, a record, for example, or how confident we are, are we that the, the spatial referencing is accurate um, or that the date range or the date is, is actually um, accurate. Um, <clears throat> how consistent have methods been applied? Have methods been used at all? Um, what, what sort of formats uh, are they standard? Uh, for instance, um, units on uh, measurements. If they're not included within the data, um, a, a unit of measuring um, distance, for example, um, could be a mile, it could be um, a kilometre, you wouldn't know. The uh, appropriate data types, if, if you don't have appropriate data types, it's difficult to, to manage um, controls. So, uh, and that, by that I mean, um, with numerical fields, you can put text into numerical fields if, uh, if it's not specified as a numeric uh, attribute. And then the other thing is how comprehensive and complete is a record? Um, does it have all the information that it needs to have to actually be a valid record or, or it, um, a, a record that has integrity? <clears throat> so some things to consider within um, uh, the design of systems uh, is the metadata, how you actually describe the data set itself. And uh, having good metadata, it builds confidence and, and helps to inform fitness for use decisions and, and the authority and, and uh, um, that, that, uh, who owns the data and how you can use it and so on, how you can cite it. Um, you know what what sort of methods have been used, and it's uh, it's those sorts of bits of information that help people to actually help downstream users to actually make informed decisions about its suitability for their particular use. Some record level considerations um, are, are use of appropriate data types, as I mentioned before. Um, applying managed rules and validations and algorithms into uh, form templates so that it makes it easy for people to enter data more accurately. Having meta attributes, uh, precision measures and accuracy measures on particular attributes of interest um, actually built into the system. Um, <clears throat> applying attribute level standards, so mapping to uh, Darwin Core and other standards uh, as much as possible so that uh, the data is interchangeable and, and interpretable by other systems. And that multiple data sets can be merged readily to, um, to, to help researchers to, to build, um, you know, sort of more complete pictures for, for the, of the information for their particular uses. Putting in range uh, configuration constraints and range uh, around range and scope and and other aspects of the of the data, um, <clears throat> and also applying uh, curation and validation mechanisms within the form templates themselves. So applying specialised data types and and mandatory and obligation uh, uh, optional obligations on particular attributes things that you have to record in order to produce a complete record. Um, Pre-populating where you can um, so that, um, you know, people have to do less work, but it also means that, uh, for example, if you're only recording a particular species, that if you pre-populate the species field, um, that um, people don't, you know, it's always spelt correctly, for example. Um, Having vocabularies and, and uh, select lists is really useful, uh, makes it faster and easier and, and more accurate to record information 
numerics, uh, put in range limits, percentages, you, you know, can't go below zero and can't go above 100. Um, <clears throat> use mapping tools and, and, and configurations for accurate location uh, selection, GPS uh, recording, um, uh, constraining to points only if points are the only thing that's relevant or allowing polygons if polygons are relevant. If an area is relevant, allow for an area of, of um, uh, coverage that's clearly defined. So accuracy measures and that sort of thing. Um, if informed calculations are needed, then uh, building those into the system rather than uh, enforcing, uh, making people have to do those ca calculations off, off system. Um, putting in codified protocols and so on. Uh, this, these are all measures that can be built into good system design that, um, that can help to improve the quality of and, and trustworthiness of the data coming out the other end. Peter, for, for us Peter. to finish the time, we need, to, need you to finish up in a couple of minutes, okay? Yep, we'll do. Um, so no doubt we've all heard of FAIR principles, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So things that system designers can do um, is, and, and people running projects, register them in searchable catalogs um, and fully describe projects with, uh, um, and, and data sets with proper metadata. Um, open access, sharing and API based access uh, um, with open licenses is uh, what makes it accessible. Again, metadata and uh, use of data standards uh, to make information interoperable and pretty much the same thing to make it reusable. So just in summary, um, Many citizen science projects are a lot more than just record level species observations. Um, species observations are the, the currency that most of us deal in uh, at, at the aggregator level, but um, uh, there's a lot of covariate information required in many citizen science projects that needs also to be captured. Um, there's many different platforms for citizen science, but uh, lots of variation in capability. Um, none necessarily better than others, just that they're, they're different. And, um, uh, but selection of the appropriate platforms, um, you know, should be uh, considered, I guess, when designing or uh, forming up projects. And platforms can be Yeah, Sorry. This is the last slide. Um, so, so uh, and the other thing is dovetailing systems in with uh, approaches for verification, such as Emily has described. So, thank you. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, you've given us a lot to think about there. And I'll also mention to, um, to everybody in the space here that there is a nice discussion happening in the chat uh, over on Whova. So um, we will have time at the end, hopefully, for um, to address some of these things. But I invite speakers and, and others in the audience to um, go over to the chat in Whova and uh, add your two cents. Uh, there's a nice discussion there. Um, thanks again, Peter. And now I will turn it over to Kari. Okay, uh, thank you. I assume you can hear me and see my presentation well. Yes, everything uh, looks great. Yeah, um, so, uh, so I'm, I'm coming from Finland, as I said already before, and I'm uh, coming from the Helsinki University, from the Finnish Museum of Natural History, by the Informatics Unit. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, uh, about tackling quality challenges, and I, I did really like a lot what Peter was just saying, and I'm trying to show some of the things that we have been trying to, to, to do in, in order to, to solve those challenges that we face all the time, especially in terms of trust and, uh, and, and such, uh, such issues that are, we are facing every day in, in sharing the data as, as we do as our main um, kind of uh, practice. So um, I will try to use my 10 minutes efficiently um, by running through quickly what FinBIF is about, and then they say a few words about 
the most important data user groups we have and try to shed some light to quality asset assignment measures we have and then uh, talk about a little bit about annotation system we have and filtering data by quality and then do some conclusions. So um, a few words about FinBIF. So this is the research national research infrastructure uh, that currently holds about 40 million and plus um, uh, observation records, including the natural history collection specimen information. So, okay, my, my slides are not changing for some reason. Hang on, what should I press now? The arrows. Do the are... arrows, yeah, the arrows work no. for you. <laughs> Hang on, I use the, there's a, these buttons at the bottom. Yeah, that works. So the, the way we harvest data, um, we harvest data from well multiple uh, you know sources, but I have divided them in three groups. So there is natural history collections. We are quite lucky in Finland since we have only one uh, uh, collection management system that is managed by us at the museum, and it's used by all uh, biggest uh, and most uh, relevant uh, collection holding institutions. Um, and then uh, we have the research and monitoring and survey data coming from uh, multiple sources as well, uh, research institutions and such, including our, our surveys and monitoring services. And then, of course, the citizen science and, and then the enthusiastic data is, is very important, especially, uh, well, it comes from uh, through a different project, but also through different uh, means like iNaturalist and such. But to conclude is that all the data is flowing into one system, which is called FinBIF, Finnish Biodiversity Information Facility. And what happens to the data in FinBIF is that we have two, we have a data warehouse that is divided into two, or we have two separate data warehouses, as you wish. Uh, one is for open data and one is for restricted data. So in a species.fi uh, uh, portal, uh, all the data is shared, the open data as it is, as it, as it should be, and then also, the restricted data is shared as generalized. To, um, it depends, of course, what sort of data are we speaking about the sensitive species or speaking, speaking about the uh, research embargo data and such. It depends that what sort of generalization and obscure, obscuring is done for that data. But anyway, it's there uh, also available. But we also have another portal for authorized use, users only, for, uh, which is called the public authorities portal that uh, has all the data as it has been originally recorded. So there's no, no um, generalization taking place. So <clears throat> then um, uh, to, my, to my topic, um, so I will, I'm speaking about the data quality, how do we manage with data quality? And our principle is that all data is good data. Anticipating that the users have information available to understand the data and its usability. I picked two major <clears throat> user groups here as an example. So we have the research sector and the decision makers. I, I, we regard them as most important users and bigger user groups. Of course, there are many others and, uh, and also education sector naturally is one of them. But like uh, when it comes to researchers, uh, we feel that the skilled they are uh, relatively skilled uh, data managers, especially when it comes to domain specific data. Uh, they also understand the data deficits and also the potential biases and uh, they can use raw data and such. So the requirements are such that we have decided or we have designed uh, uh, to, to, to offer them this R package that is uh, linked to our API directly. And it seems to be quite functional, functional means. And then um, when it comes to decision makers, as uh, in our case, it means uh, mainly municipalities, uh, regional environment centers, uh, state research institutions and ministries, etc. Um, in their case, uh, uh, they are, uh, well, in our opinion, they are average to poor data managers. They need more aggregated data. They need quality labeled data. And also, funnily enough, they quite often ask 100% correct data, which is a uh, uh, a bit of a misconception that I think you cannot really have, find such data anywhere. But this is this is how they feel that anyway we have provided we are providing the the public authorities portal for their usage and try to take into account uh, their needs 
in, in, in terms of quality. I'm just talking about quality in this case in general. So, so in FinBiv, there about the quality assignment, we have a, a three ways in FinBiv to assign quality tags or information to occurrences. We have the observation reliability assignment, then we have the data set origin assignment, and then metadata. Here you see the how the quality ranking is displayed in the species portal, the .fi portal. So a few first few words about the observation reliability assignment. Um, as a default, um, <clears throat> uh, all the occurrence records are assigned as unassessed. That's to start with. Even in the so-called professional data sets or collections, data itself has been assigned unassessed if there are no active annotations. Uh, given all other factors defining them to be considered as verified. These symbols below you see that help the users quickly to see the quality tag of, of the certain um, observation they're interested in. Uh, then we have the uh, uh, data set uh, uh, origin assignment. So whenever there's a new uh, data set, each uh, time a new data set collection or source is added into FinBiv, they are assigned, assigned with a classification, whether they become part of data sets by professionals, by specialists or citizen scientists. Also, uh, uh, within, the, within all these categories, there is the same general classification given to any data records. And naturally, you can browse and uh, browse the data by using any of the combinations, but it takes a, a bit of, a, <clears throat> bit of uh, getting acquainted with the, with the system. So it's not really that self-evident what you click and what you get. So that it, it, it requires a lot of guidance to, to do it properly. Um, and then uh, third way is, as it was also mentioned, as an important in the previous presentation, the metadata. In the metadata description, you can you can uh, <clears throat> you can describe the, the data set qualities and problems for users uh, uh, to make decisions if this uh, uh, data set is is uh, particular data set is good for your own needs, and this is. Quite basic, but very, very, very important part of the of the data management itself. Then I'll uh, introduce uh, to you our annotation system for individual records. Here is an example of a um, where the, the submission is is done by using the citizen science project called Fungal Atlas, and it has a good evidence. There are some good pictures involved into this into this particular record, but it's still, as you see, it's still observation reliability as unassessed because it has not been um, um, uh, annotated or it doesn't have, have any, any other, other reason to be, to be verified or, or validated data as such. But uh, even though it's a citizen science project, since it's been guided and steered, uh, by by uh, taxonomist, it is regarded as a, as a class two, so a specialist data set, as you see here, with two two blocks here, experts, hobbyist, expert curated data. But when it comes to uh, then the annotations, you see at the bottom there's a there's a there's a, a, a button called comment. If you do <clears throat> a comment as a basic level annotator, which means that any registered user can can do such, uh, you are able to add tags um, uh, as, as presented here and also if you agree with the observation you can you can you can verify that and it then it becomes a community very verified observation but there's also another way to do it if you're an expert as an expert level annotator your input makes the difference to data itself so you may change the identification of the data or confirm the current uh, uh, identification so that the data becomes verified. And of course, you can add, add other similar tags to it as well, and as well uh, uh, use a, this as a spam or other other attributes to 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 notify uh, that there are some problems with, with this particular data. Um, you can also uh, 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 use some tools to filter uh, the, the qualities 
of the data, but uh, as you see that some of them may even look funny to you, but they're all based on, on, on user stories that are required by, by some of the users. They want to fill the data based on these, but I think uh, most important part for, for anybody, the user trying to kind of become appealing to, to, uh, to those people that are uh, happily annotating and improving the data quality. We have this uh, special page for uh, quality control where you can see the, see and browse the, uh, uh, the, uh, the annotated and uh, observations. And, and, and then there's also a list of most active annotators as such. So it, it, it kind of helps there. Uh, we believe that it helps helps and uh, it encourages people to to um, uh, to become an expert and to, to use your expert skills to annotate the data, improve the quality. Uh, then finally, I have some summary and conclusions. So, uh, so these are just the, our conclusions. We have those that we have found useful to serve our purposes in regards to data quality management. So first is that you should identify your user group needs. This is this is uh, most important. Then uh, what we have found out that uh, by by classifying uh, the the quality, it helps helps the users as well to 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 take into account different types and different kinds of data. Uh, as it is in our case, we we uh, classify them by the origin of the data set as well as the occurrences by by annotations or by default or other 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 means that that may may um, uh, have an impact to a, um, an individual occurrence record then uh, we decided to to uh, make the annotation system in a way that we have separate experts annotations that does or do that do uh, immediately change and have an impact to data itself of course the older history information is stored and is still uh, available but it doesn't have an impact to data uh, when when the annotation is done and then the hobbyist which uh, can uh, mainly uh, add tags or uh, if they verify the, uh, uh, the observation it becomes a, a community verified then uh, there are some issues still to be resolved. Uh, how do we make the annotations effective in all primary databases? Currently, the annotations stay in FinBIF data warehouse. They don't automatically go into the primary databases, but we are working on it. And uh, there are some, some solutions coming along in, in the near future. And then uh, one of the also big challenges is how to mass annotate uh, multiple observations so that it's efficient way and it's user friendly and reliable so that you don't make a lot of mistakes if you do the mass mass annotations it can also be kind of counterproductive a way way to annotate stuff and then finally um, uh, the question is that how to communicate promote motivate encourage experts to be involved what we have done we have uh, created these browsing tools to help people to to look uh, what they are interested in and try to encourage them to 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 annotate and to, to expert uh, use the expertise and and then of course the acknowledgement of those uh, annotators having a list of people who are the most active that also seems to be helping helping um, um, at least to a certain extent and also i think one of the biggest uh, I would say success says we have had is that we have been able to develop projects for curation specific uh, for specific uh, groups of of plants or animals or, or any 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 other uh, groups that uh, uh, that uh, that needs needs uh, att attention that is urgent to to have more quality data so we have found it's a good way to to establish a project for for specifically for that reason and finally i just want to thank you for inviting me to speak here and i'm happy to hear any questions and, and continue talking about the same subject thank you thank you very much that those are some great details in there um, i really appreciate the um uh, all of those details thanks and I'm going to pass it right on to our next speaker, looking at the time here, uh, our next and final speaker in this session. Um, and I'm actually, I think it's both of, um, 
both of you guys, Brandon and, and Greg. Um, so I'll, I'll pass it over to you. And um, I will um, again plug um, the discussions in Whova. A couple of things have popped up for some of our speakers. So if you'd like to contribute in there, that'd be great. Um, and uh, take it away, Brandon. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yes, looks good. good. Sounds good. All right. Uh, I'm Brandon Budnicki, and I'm going to be presenting today with uh, Dr. Greg Newman, uh, talking about sharing by the biodiversity observations across different platforms. And so we're going to focus on, you know, two things that we're very familiar with, which is sitside.org, um, which is actually part of, uh, it, Greg is the director of sitside.org, and it's a citizen science platform for sharing uh, observations against many different projects. And then we're also going to be talking about the PPSR core uh, data and metadata standard for citizen science. Uh, so first, um, we're going to talk about SITSI for a little bit, and I'm going to pass it over to Greg. Yeah, you bet, Brandon. Thank you. Um, next slide. We, uh, we went on a journey, and uh, these presentations up, leading up to this have been fantastic. Emily, great overview on a summary of different approaches for data quality and citizen science. And Peter and um, everyone on this session, um, great, great overview of platforms. And so we went on a journey many years ago to create a platform that was multi-topic, as Peter pointed out, and not just singular topic. And so hence was born CITSA.org, a global citizen science platform supporting a variety of projects uh, across different domains of science. And part and parcel to this platform is our project builder and data sheet creator and flexible governance structures and flexible data privacy options and all delivered through web and mobile applications. And so, um, maybe next slide. What SITSI is today is, is a, a, a platform hosting and curating science data um, from citizen science projects, now well over a thousand projects with uh, over a million observations of, of natural phenomena. These might be water quality measurements, um, but obviously here in Tadwig, they obviously may, and many do include biodiversity observations. And the platform is very flexible with respect to the attributes measured by volunteers. And so, yeah, that's great, Brandon. Um, and so these projects might come in the flavor of, of the Bird Conservancy Bald Eagle Watch project, for example, invasive plant mapping, Utah Water Watch, um, urban tree monitoring, trout unlimited initiatives, et cetera. And so the, the point being here is, is that we are faced with much like what Pyre, Peter described is very heterogeneous initiatives and therefore heterogeneous data. And so part and parcel to that becomes amplified importance of documenting through standardized metadata approaches these heterogeneous data collection schemes. So next slide. So what the way these, these heterogeneous projects really come to be born is through our data sheet creator, which um, I really appreciated the slide Peter shared of the different platforms out there. And the, it kind of really gave a, a lay of the landscape as to the different strengths and weaknesses. But this, this particular platform's data sheet creator is modeled after some of those mentioned like survey one, two, three in that list that Peter shared. And we're really, it's a, it's a drag and drop interface where projects can create protocols and data sheets that guide and, and direct volunteer work for their observations made of, of phenomena. And so in this situation, there's situations where you can have min max, you drag and drop a number, you can specify a min and max, and, and, and to Peter's point, you can structure the quality at the data entry point, which is one of those approaches Emily shared. So next slide. Um, so with that data sheet creator are born a variety of projects, now thousands of them globally, and are born these observations um, made by volunteers. So I'm going to turn it over to Brandon to talk about the infrastructure that is sit, hosts sitsci.org, and then we'll delve into data standards. Mm -hmm. So as we talk about, you know, community building in citizen science, you know, it's important both at the citizen scientist level, but also as, as members of this community, our ethos is openness. And so we just went through a complete rebuild over the last three years of sitside.org. I came on as the, the lead software developer in January of this year, um, but we launched this new platform built entirely from open source tools so that we can you know, take advantage of 
the open source community, but also contribute back to it because together, both in citizen science and in software development, as a community, we can all grow together. Um, so I'm not gonna go into each tool that we use. I think that's beyond the scope of this top talk, but um, here they are listed out. Feel free to ask me about them later. Um, but, you know, as part of that open openness uh, ethos and how many different projects are part of our platform, ultimately we, we've made it so that the project managers are in control of how their project is organized and how their data is shared with others. And so on the membership side of things, projects can be open or closed and closed projects require either uh, some kind of approval by a manager or um, require an invitation from a manager. On the data privacy side of things, projects are either public where all the observation data <clears throat> is licensed under the Creative Commons license so that it can be reused or under um, the private model where only the project members can access that observation data. And this is really useful for groups that are monitoring endangered species where there are great concerns about poaching if that data was you know, made public. Um, so now we're gonna talk, uh, Greg's gonna talk about the biodiversity support that SITSI 2.0 has. Yeah, so at the, the humble beginnings of this platform, there, there was a really strong emphasis on biodiversity support, um, having some roots in invasive species mapping and modeling and species distribution modeling, um, relying on observations made by the lay public to improve those models and forecast, ecological forecasts and predictions. And so towards that end, we built this at the beginning from the onset with support for and, and really embracing the GBIF taxonomic backbone. And we've built on top of that a user-friendly interface for common name additions, important in citizen science so project managers can use vernaculars that are relevant and, and familiar with volunteers in their locale and region. And then we've made this compliant with the PPSR core project metadata standard. And Brandon will share more details about that standard in a moment. Um, this standard is derived from Darwin Core and other data standards and leverages a lot of existing standards in its in its terminology and, and metadata fields and is already adopted by scientific domains and so we've built this based on these standards for the purposes of sharing information broadly through standardized means. And um, I'm, I'll talk about how we support organism biodiversity data collection in three different ways. Um, and just as a reminder, project managers can add additional attributes associated with these, uh, these observations, not just a presence absence of a species occurrence, as we're of course widely familiar with in eBird and iNaturalist. And so for example, a project can measure height, weight, um, nest success, this sort of thing, number of, of eggs, lots of different heterogeneous attributes that are relevant to their citizen science investigations. The three approaches, so next slide, Brandon, the three approaches we use for um, biodiversity uh, data collection are single organisms, example here being our bald eagle watch, looking at the bald eagle and nest success of those, those, those species, a pick list of organisms where people can specify an N number of organisms that they want their volunteers to focus on and become familiar with through trainings. And then a third, just kind of more of a bio blitz mode where they can empower folks to just tap and, and browse the taxonomic backbone for any organism they may encounter, for example, during a bio blitz. So next Next slide, Brandon. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the uh, different approaches for data quality that um, Emily referred to earlier. The categorization is a, a little bit different and I'm actually excited to read her paper. But this 2011 paper looked at projects, um, data quality methodologies and what they'd actually implemented, not just looking at the projects in SITSI, but looking at 200 some projects across all different platforms, but also paper-based or email-based projects. And so the com most common approach, as Emily alluded to before, is that expert review, um, where an expert goes in and looks at an observation after the fact to assess the quality. And right now we're actually working in partnership with Bald Eagle Watch trying to implement expert review as part of the standard process within SITSI. 
So right now it's kind of ad hoc in that, you know, they review it when they download their data, but we want to implement and institutionalize that in a process through the platform itself. The other common approaches that we see are photo submissions so that, you know, if you're measuring something, having a photo of the thing being measured, you know, allows to do that, you know, referencing and verification. And then for many projects, it's also still very common to have a paper data sheet that users are filling out because maybe they don't have internet access and they can submit that photo with observation itself. So we support photos at two different levels, either you know, N number of photos can be associated with any observation, but we also have a field where project managers can request a specific photo relevant to what they're studying. Um, we don't have time to go through all of these, these options, uh, you know, all of these approaches right now. We have, you know, pretty good general support towards the top and most common approaches. Um, and so we're trying to, you know, start down, at, start at the top of the list and move our way down in terms of you know, developing out these tools. And this brings up a really important need that I'm going to get to in, when we talk about PPSR core is that documenting, documenting the data quality approach in a data set, it would be very useful to trying to standardize metadata and that, that doesn't exist today. And so now we're gonna talk about PPSR core, which is a standard for citizen science data collection that's made up of three different pieces. There's the projects, which are like the name of the project, who's funding it, um, and other contextual information. There's data sets, which Peter referenced before in his talk and went in a lot more depth, but that is you know, a collection of observations and a description of the general protocol or methodology that was actually used to collect that data. And then the observation data itself. This uh, standard is actually a collaboration between the Citizen Science Association the European Union Citizen Science, Citizen Science Association and the Australian Citizen Science Association. We have about 25 authors of this standard of which Greg and I are just you know, two of those co-authors uh, along with Peter and a number of actually other people that are in this call. Um, but it's not just for biodiversity data collection. Um, and so in the observation model we've built is for each type of observation for either biodiversity, we're looking at Darwin Core as a reference to, you know, what is the standard for collecting that biodiversity information. But for other scientific fields, we're also trying to move into that space as well. And, uh, but the really important thing here is data reuse. That's what, you know, these standards really, you know, allow is that by transparent, transparently sharing the data quality methods or other information about this, individual researchers can assess the fitness for use. And it's really important to know who's maintaining and building a, a data set, who's funding it, but also you know, information about the methodology and protocol, which is included in the PPSR core standard today. Um, but as we move forward, we would like to also include some of those data quality metrics. Um, you know. And I, I welcome anyone you know, listening to this talk to, to join us for those, those conversations uh, because we are an open group um, and you don't have to be a member of any citizen science association to, to contribute to our, our discussions. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Greg to talk about a, a very specific project and how they handle data quality. Yeah, so as Brandon pointed out, these metadata standards are, are extremely important for transparency and assuring fitness for use and reuse of this, this important and very, very, very valuable biodiversity conservation data. Um, in this case, just to kind of give a quick case study of, of leveraging and capitalizing on that, the, the, a collaboration formed between Colorado Parks and Wildlife and um, a nonprofit called the, Bald, the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. And these, these, these 
these data consist not only of species occurrence observations of the bald eagle along the front range and throughout the state of Colorado, but also additional attributes about nest success. And this, this became very important for actionable real-time data for real conservation applications, whereby Colorado Parks and Wildlife biologists um, seamlessly cat, you know, tap and look at the real-time data coming into this open platform and can decide which nest to go to for bird banding ac activities um, to then track and monitor um, success of the, this species um, in real time. And so this became an extremely valuable, important um, resource for the, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife decision-making agency, really making conservation decisions as urban encroachment continues to um, you know, affect these, these nests um, statewide. So um, this group is actively working with SITSI to, to bake into the platform, as Brandon mentioned, uh, more, more platform mediated means for data quality assurance um, using these standards. So back to you, Brandon. All right, so next steps and big takeaways from, from our work and, and research. So on the sit side side of things, you know, we're actively working to operation, operationalize quality assurance controls, um, both focusing on expert review, but then also looking at the ratings and feedback of individual observers or within individual observations. And then as we alluded to before, we are currently pulling out the identifiers for specific species occurrence out of GBIF. Um, but we would like to share that actual occurrence data that we have back with the um, GBIF ecosystem so that it can be more widely used at the project manager's discretion, of course. Um, on the PPSR core side of things, uh, we are actively working to develop the observation model to accommodate different standards from different scientific domains. Right now, a lot of what's in the standard is focused on biodiversity, but we think that, you know, with all the abiotic or environmental information that is out there, you know, having a place, for, you know, a, a way to, to codify that information as well is really important. And along with that, looking at how do we incorporate quality assurance metadata into the data sets and observation models themselves so that when data is shared across platforms that that information comes through too. So the big takeaways here for, for all of you are that data standards raise the bar for trustworthiness and citizen science by knowing how and why data was collected and analyzed. This is really key, you know, it's, it, towards a you know, community building exercise because there has to be trust and transparency between the participants involved and the project managers and any other researchers that are going to be using that data. And then you know, along that line, you know, by, by fostering a strong partnership with these communities, researchers are able to you know, assist in making actionable and just decisions. And that really is you know, the point of a lot of our citizen science research but also you know, in building the inclusive platform of tomorrow. With that, um, we'd like to, to thank a number of different people within uh, CSU and uh, Colorado, well, at, within Colorado State University, but also thanks to all of our collaborators and co-authors on the PPSR core data standard. Thank you very much, guys. Um, we have just a couple of minutes in the scheduled time here for discussion um, and questions. And I'll start off with a question that is in Whova. Um, I see that Greg also responded to one of them in the chat there. Thanks, Greg. Um, so this one from um, Siobhan Leachman. She says, this has been a great symposium and I particularly like Brandon's presentation as it started addressing trust from citizen science, from citizen scientist perspective. Are there recommendations or standards that exist for scientists and managers of citizen science projects that ensures that participants trust scientists and managers of projects? And she follows up to clarify that is trust them to use the data and use it appropriately to share the data to protect the data from disappearing, i.e. archived appropriately, requires that citizen scientists attribute the citizen scientists when using their work and enables the citizen scientists to have access to the research results, including scientific papers based on the citizen scientists work. Um, yeah, that's a pretty big um, <laughs> question and issue there. Uh, if you guys wanna comment quickly, and then of course, um, who was there to um, respond in text if you wanted 
All right. Yeah. Well, Brandon, go ahead. Yep. Take it. Sure. Sure. So one of the, one of the key things that I, I take away from that question is, you know, that trust and relationship between the researchers and the citizen science on the ground, actually creating observations. And there's based off of, you know, Peter's earlier talk about there being kind of a couple of different types of platforms. There's the ones that are heterogeneous in that all of the data is, you know, collected in the same format and there might be regional projects, but, you know, the data is very standard in that way, as opposed to sitside.org where the projects are very dissimilar. The data they're recording is very dissimilar because it might be across any number of scientific domains. And so, the approach that we've taken with sitside.org is to largely leave that up to the individual project managers. And so we have, you know, some best practices that we, we try to share in terms of, you know, this discussion on data quality and the options available to them for ensuring that. Um, but, and, you know, also trying to implement and institutionalize, you know, tools to allow them to share their results. But ultimately it is up to the individual project managers to actually utilize those tools. Yeah, and Libby, I'll add to that. There was a fantastic question and tons to unpack there, but on the trust part of that question, I read a fascinating paper and I'll try to dig it up and share it in chat um, about 10, maybe eight years ago about trust and reuse in ecology, not in citizen science-based ecology, but ecology. And that paper concluded that as much as the metadata are important and it extremely is there's these there's these cultural and social norms that are also part of that trust equation and that is relationships with the ecologist or the like prism data for example is a trustworthy climate-based data that comes from i think osu oregon state university and so it's important to understand that there's a accumulation of trust as more and more people start reusing and becoming confident with the quality of a data set derived from a particular citizen science campaign over time and that's that's part of everything Emily described and Brandon described in these approaches that can be taken, but it's also relationships. And so um, just to add to that, that that paper uncovered the importance of relationships with data producers from data reusers and between those two people. I'd like to step in here and ask Kerry to comment. In, in one of his slides, he differentiated between um, uh, scientists as uh, sort of understanding that all data aren't perfect and and then uh, more public policy people who somehow think all data are are perfect. Um, what is your experience there? What, what comments do you have about the trust issue and data quality? Well, thank you for asking because that was something that I wanted to share anyway. <laughs> But yeah, I think this is a this is a very interesting discussion. We speak about the metadata and we speak about the reliability of the data set and all kinds of descriptions. But when it comes to public authorities who are actually one of the most important players in terms of the, you know, the, the biodiversity conservation and you know, because the land use decisions are made by them. That is that is the fact. And the, the, the issue is that they really don't have a clue. They don't want to read any metadata descriptions. They just want you to tell them. We are a data aggregator in Finland and they are using our data solely, not our data, but our, the, 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 our services. And this is, has been a very, very long, long term discussion. And, and still I'm, I'm struggling a lot trying to convince them that citizen science data is good data. And there's this misconception and there's a lot of doubt about it. They want only to use the, you know, the research institutions data or collection data from the, from the history museum collections and such, which they consider reliable. But, uh, and we have come to a point, even luckily the ministries also understand that we cannot ignore good citizen science data. And this is something that we need to be able to communicate with, with these public authorities who are making the decisions on land use, which is the, the biggest threat to, as we all know, for biodiversity. And if, if we are not able to convince them that, yes, you have to take into account also the citizen science data Data, which most data is citizen science data, basically, and this is this is the I think this is a big constraint, and I think we, we really need to uh, try to find innovative ways to to communicate. It's a, it's more about communication. It's about sharing and trying to convince 
that like you know showing all kinds of methods that you do and once it's done they don't read the metadata descriptions they just whether they take it or whether they don't take it and that that is the, the big 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 question i think thanks maybe maybe it's like uh, greg was advocating it's the trust between you and them that's at the root of what's going on peter please chime in and tell us your experience in australia with these same issues i know there you also support uh some uh, private uh, uh, environmental people collecting data with regard to environmental impacts and things like that. I think you're mute, Peter. Did, did Peter freeze? Are you are you there, Peter? I'll, uh, maybe while Peter's yeah, getting um, unfrozen, I'll invite Emily too for uh, a UK and um, and her project, her research perspective as well. Um, well, I was just going to agree with what Carrie said. Like it's uh, <laughs> the data collected by citizen science is collected at scale and volume that is unmatched by other methods. So I don't understand why. And also historically, a lot of the UK, I mean, all of our species data in the UK is citizen science data. It's just not labelled as such. Um, and now suddenly we've put a label on citizen science when, I don't know, we, this data is a huge resource and it has been used in research throughout. But I just, I do think transparency is very important at all stages whether that's reporting on how you're verifying the data or reporting on how the data is used for um, beyond the collection. And I think that the feedback between, going back to the question about that Siobhan asked earlier, I think that having, I don't know, it. I think it needs to be collaborative between the volunteers and the researchers. And I think the citizen science is a wonderful tool for democratizing science in so many ways as well. That um, having that kind of feedback loop between those who are managing it and those who are collecting the data to continue and to just to show the research outputs of the efforts that the citizen scientists are. Um, are going to through. I don't know if that was a collection of my thoughts over everyone else's excellent comments as well. <laughs> yeah, well said. Thank you. No, I Thank appreciate you. your addition. Um, there's so, a so sorry, so sorry about that. I dropped out at a very awkward time. Oops. Um, there's a, a an analogy or comparison that I, I like to make in this field to that of wikis and, and Wikipedia in that at the very, very early days of wikis, um, they were very focused on very specific scientific fields. And then Wikipedia came along and tried to be very general. But the question was, is, okay, if this is not curated by experts, how can this information be trusted? And we've seen them kind of establish themselves over time as becoming trusted as they've established those norms and protocols for how the articles are edited and how quality assurance comes about. And we're still very early on in those stages. But I see that this, you know, is probably going to develop over time following a very similar path. And that, you know, that's how we're going to really enter, you know, citizen science into the general public consciousness. Great points. I, I see two here in um, the Zoom and Whova chats, Elizabeth Martin um, stating it may be perception and social cultures need to address sociocultural aspects in terms of trustworthiness of data. And, and that's a fantastic point. And I think echoed also in Whova by Matt Yoder, who says, could you build trust through language, through the language they were trained to speak, publishing studies in scientific journals? Um, so I think those are other areas um, to consider when building trust and um, uh, working with our stakeholders in those ways.
Libby, I'll add to that too, that there was this brief discussion and mentioned in many of the talks about structured data and, you know, to the degree that citizen scientists can follow regimented protocols like experimental designs and transects and, and nested plots, this will elevate the, the, the perception of trust by decision-making agencies, in my opinion. And I think that if, if we can better understand the, 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 the data quality requirements of decision-making entities, we can bake that into the protocols of citizen science data collection schemes and marry the two so that we can have better trust. So I, I'd like to make two points along that line, uh, just continuing Greg's comments. One of the things that we've watched is the broad use of museum data to predict species distributions. And that's only presence, presence only data. And, and yet the scientific community embraced that, used it and was able to, to go far with it. So I think it's more about this two things. One is that we citizen scientists, uh, scientists quote unquote, uh, never got their, their union card to do science. They, they didn't make it they weren't from the academy. And, and then the second thing is that citizen science as a process is um, we're still in the process of, of learning how to do it well. So it's sort of once the method works, then you can make sure it's accurate. So it's, it, it almost seems like a two stage. We're, we're demanding a lot of ourselves to have it work perfectly well and produce perfect data. Whereas the first time we try any scientific method, it, we're usually not that good at it. It takes us a while to get good at it. There's, there's also a measure of sort of strengths and weaknesses in, in, in terms of um, the, uh, the, the, the kinds of sort of protocols and coverage. You know, citizen science is, is really good at broad scale coverage um, uh, and, and can be really good at, at intensive as well, but often, you know, covers large areas and, and, and temporal scales that... Um, uh, the more intensive research programs can't. Um, and uh, I, I think perhaps recognition of that is, you know, amongst the, the research community is, uh, is warranted as well. It, um, it needs a bit of nuance um, in terms of, um, you know, sort of understanding of those differences. Uh, I note that we are um, beyond our scheduled time. There's nothing happening in this room for another 30 minutes or so, um, but to be mindful of the fact that folks may have only um, limited time to work with here and the fact that it's getting quite late in Europe. Um, wanted to make sure that before anybody pops off that we were able to thank our speakers, thank our participants, and um, thank the Tadwig organizers. This has been a fantastic week, really, um, this session and, and all five days of this conference. So I want to give a big thank you to the organizers and the UF support team who have been phenomenal um, all week. And um, I do look forward to continued conversations um, on this topic, uh, even in the Hoover space that we that's created here for the symposium, as well as a month from now in the workshop. And I think even the discussions that were, um, the questions that were posed just now, we can use to seed um, our um, discussions then at the, the workshop in a month. So I look forward to hopefully seeing lots of you guys there as well. Um, I didn't mean to totally um, um, stop discussion now, but did want to at least mention that before folks pop off. Uh, I know that I do need to pop off too. So. Um, uh, if folks want to continue. I think this room is available for another thirty minutes, so um, we can we can continue for a bit. And I, I'm going to go. So thanks, everybody, and um, I you, will Libby. hopefully see you soon. Bye bye. We have many other people who are attending who probably have some good thoughts and ideas. We welcome uh, the opportunity to hear from you. And since it's moved to the informal stage, why don't you just turn on your microphones and, and, uh, and start sharing your opinions. And uh, we have four, four speakers here who have a mountain of experience with citizen science and with data and with data standards. So please uh, 
please share your your thoughts and your questions with them. I may have missed it. Uh, this is Annie Simpson, USGS. I may have missed it, but I'm somewhat surprised that I haven't heard more about, um, maybe it's because this is a data conference, but citizen science is um, in our community, in ecology where much, much, much money is has landed. Citizen science is really important to get data in an inexpensive way. Yes, no. I'll, I think I'll, yes. I think yes. Yeah, great question, Annie. I, I agree. Um, uh, there was a master student, Brian Farver, who did an analysis of a ROI, uh, economic analysis. And um, I, I'll point you to his thesis uh, to try to quantify that a little bit. And I think there's been some work done on that, but in, a, it, it, you know, in my opinion, I agree with Rob and yourself. Annie, it's most prominent in the, in the water monitoring community where many, many states have um, given up uh, doing that kind of work in, in, fa in favor of river and pond and lake watch groups. Um, and that's, uh, hasn't borne as much fruit as it might because the data that they produce hasn't um, trickled into a database that's e easily accessible. EPA has been working on that, but I don't quite understand all the ins and outs of that. I hadn't really realized that the states had given up a lot of effort because I work at USGS. We have mon water monitors all over the nation and continue to do so. And they're washed away with floods, but we put them back in. I, I had not I'm not in water, so I didn't realize how important state work on water had been in relation to monitoring. The, the USGS has done a tremendous amount of uh, work. And the thing that I see uh, used all the time are, are, are the flow gauges um, in, in rivers. Um, you know, that's, that's the basis for so much science. It's amazing how many different groups depend on that. And of course, it's paramount to understanding uh, flooding and droughts. You know, um, and I have seen in local news, whenever USGS decides not to replace one of those monitors, the locals kind of go, we need that, put it back. <laughs> so they do appreciate the federal effort. That's why I, I just didn't realize that the states had given up so much that they had previously been very important. It makes well, sense. Please. Yeah, the states have given up on uh, sampling specific water quality parameters, such as uh, nutrients, um, you know, basic things like temperature and 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 um, pH and 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 uh, different kinds of nitrogen measurements, or um, or basic E. coli, you know, uh, some kind of bacterial loading, conductivity, those kinds of things. That's where the states did a lot uh, as, as, as from state employees. And, and a lot of that now is done by river and pond and water watch groups of various sorts. Coastal water watch too. I, can I just make a point about, not, sorry to cycle back, but um, uh, the question about um, you know, cost efficiencies with citizen science. Um, I think in general, my experience with that is uh, that it's fairly true, except the, the caveat on that is that um, it tends to shift a little bit from uh, cost intensive um, field expeditions uh, to more resources being put into uh, communications and, and uh, engagement. Um, the, the really successful citizen science projects that I've seen have actually had really good um, comms and engagement and that does take resources. I don't mean to dominate, but that is so important in the United States right now when the opinion of science is, is, being, is plummeting among half of our population. It's really important to do outreach on and work with the citizens for scientific data collection. Keep doing what you're doing, guys. Citizen, sciences, citizen science rocks. When I retire, that's probably what I'm gonna to try to do. Yeah, and along the, the, the thoughts on, on funding is, is, yeah, I think in a lot of ways, citizen science has seen 
by these larger states, or at least the United States federal government is a, is a cost saving exercise in a lot of ways. And so we've, it, it, but it, the, the fact is that citizen science is not free. Yes, the, the volunteer time and effort, it doesn't have a marginal cost, but there's costs with the communications and with the platforms. And I'll admit that it's, it's very difficult for the platforms. We are getting funded almost entirely on a project by project basis because the research mechanisms for funding aren't well designed to actually support scientific infrastructure. And so, you know, but we can only, you know, get those research dollars if we're building something new for that project, not for the daily operation. So that, that it's a real struggle because citizen science is seen as this very cheap way to do research. And that's ultimately not the case. Software is expensive. That's a really excellent point, Brandon. And, and communication can be expensive too. Yes. And, and training, because if you do citizen science, and don't train, your data isn't as good and your software can't fix that. Mm -hmm. And the, the individuals that are doing a lot of this expert field research aren't necessarily the ones that are gonna be the greatest communicators because that's not really what their, their background is. I wish I was a better communicator, but I'm a software developer. <laughs> you do a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> So I have a question. Um, so I'm um, very much interested in the global level and in the work of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which currently is developing the post-2020 global biodiversity monitoring framework. And I was wondering, what do you like? How do you see the relationship of citizen science and global monitoring, or national reporting, which is the step, um, that's a data pathway. And um, so that is the one thing, so the relationship between the post 2020 and, and citizen science. And the other question is, um, do you think it is possible to scale up citizen science uh, to a global scale? I'll take a crack at that. Citizen science is already working at the global scale. Um, and uh, the repository, you, you, as you probably know, that holds most of the data are, uh, is GBIF. And most of the data in GBIF come from citizen science programs about birds. A huge proportion of the data in GBIF are citizen science observations about birds. And those data are now being used to make forecasts about the state of biodiversity from a bird point of view all around the world at the population level um, and so on. And so it, it shows that when you can engage a community, you can do that on a global scale. I think eBird now gets uh, close to uh, 12,000 12, uh, 12, observations a day, something like that. It's, it's getting more than a million observations a year. And it's in every country, it's, it's got 95 or 98% of all the bird species. So that's the easiest, that's the low hanging fruit, but it's gonna make a big difference. And to complement that are the uh, agreements that are being made between governments and citizen science. So recently there was, a, we just got some emails talking about the meetings in Europe right now, uh, elevating the role of citizen science and trying to meet the, the UN goals. So I, I I've, I'll, I'll, I'll claim that if we had a thousand people that could manage infrastructure, we could do maybe 80 taxa that are easy to monitor across the globe on a, on a global network. Uh, so if we found a way to support a thousand people like Brandon and Peter and those kinds of people, that's the missing link. People are interested in doing the work. The scientists, given the data, will analyze it. That's not the problem. The problem is the infrastructure. And, and so you need two pieces. You need people like Brandon and, and Peter, but you also need, as Annie mentioned, people to train, to interact, to help uh, manage the, the projects. Those are the two, two elements you need. So I think it's entirely possible to do. We just have to find about a thousand people globally 
that can be devoted to that task. And I've calculated you need about uh, $5 billion endowment, which is the wealth of a percentage of the wealth of the richest people in the world. So if we can somehow make the argument, we can get the money, I think. Was it billion or million? No, five billion dollars endowment. Okay. Well, think about the salary of the salary for one person who's like Peter, people like Peter Brandon, by the time you add all their costs, a hundred thousand dollars a year is a good number. So you can just multiply it out. I think it's about a thousand people, but that's just my guess, but you can multiply it out and then use the interest, just run on interest. Okay, thanks a lot. But I'm happy to talk more about it anytime and I'm happy to speak to anybody you think might listen. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if uh, any, anyone has a, a good route on, on funding infrastructure, I've got about a dozen software developers that will leave their job in a heartbeat to, to come build this with me. Yeah, the, the, the problem <laughs> is citizen science, we don't have a way to support um, infrastructure yet. It's not a widely accepted tool by NSF or by the scientific community. Um, and uh, it, it will eventually be, but we're in a crisis mode with climate change and biodiversity loss. And we, we need to find a way to, to, be, um, to grow infrastructure somehow by, by private means. I don't think it's going to come from governments fast enough. It's not going to come uh, well, I don't know. We should ask Carrie about Europe. Do you think there's enough support in Europe to grow it? The, the EU is, is, is more uh, attuned to this problem than, than people in the US. And, and of course, Australia has always been in the lead. They've always had put more support into it than other countries. So maybe Peter and Carrie can talk about global infrastructure. Well, I was just going. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you go, go, Carrie. You go. <laughs> you go. <laughs> okay. I, I was Enjoy. just going to. I was just going to say that that uh, you know, just a, a fairly brief and and simple you know casting across the platforms infrastructure that that is in wide use at the moment. It's very fragmented, um, and uh, there's not a lot of standardization going on. Uh, across those various platforms. So, um, uh, you know, pulling together the, uh, the existing infrastructure community and, and getting, um, you know, some sort of standardization across the various platforms would be a, a really good starting point. And, um, and, and yeah, I think, I think Rob's suggestion that, um, you know, we, we find a way to uh, to get decent investment into the infrastructure to support citizen science globally. I think it'd be a, an excellent initiative. Yeah, I, I would like to add, and I agree with Peter. I think it's very scattered landscape, but I think uh, one of the ways to do it really that what we are doing already. I mean, using the the, the tools that are used in like in especially in Europe, like iNaturalist and others that could create something like together and you know using the same tool creating projects that are like common in europe but i think mainly currently they are quite a, like a real, um, limited to to countries countries or even regions so that it's not really it's not guided as as it should be but i would like to point out something that uh, was probably missing was that about the uh, the science and the citizen science the research and citizen science i think it's not quite true that Citizen, citizen science is not used. I think all or most of the, the monitoring schemes, long-term monitoring schemes that are run by, by the, like for instance, our museum, they are all research-based and they are done by really uh, particular scientists and they're all, the data is collected by citizens. And I could, I would like to call them citizen science project, even though they are not like a, like, not like opportunistic data or, or similar, but it is really a citizens that are collecting the data. It's just a matter of how it's being guided, who is who is leading the processes and how reliable the methods are and what, what do you do with the data, whether it's present absent data and such things that can can really make the difference. And it's, it's it is citizen science data, and this is something we shouldn't forget, I think. Thanks. That's a great point. Fantastic discussion, everyone. 
I need to duck out soon, but um, yeah, this is really great, great feedback, great comments, great thoughts. Um, I, so, yeah. I'd just like to say uh, welcome to everyone or please, please join us on the 18th to continue the discussion. It's, uh, it's excellent. I just wanted to uh, hop on here and remind you guys that the closing session will be starting in five minutes in this plat in this room. So I just want to be mindful of the time. Sounds like it's Maybe time to say goodbye. Say... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can Good say job. something really quick. Uh, so Annie pointed to the need to support infrastructure, but part of that infrastructure is basically recording names and having the tools for recording taxonomic names and we are not supporting the recorders appropriately so much of the recording of taxonomic names that we have today is volunteer work and it's also sometimes people that is affiliated to institutions but their institutions don't value their work even for some major databases and they are being asked, why do you do this? And, and that's a waste of time and you shouldn't be doing this. So until we don't bring these people to the spotlight and support them and give them appreciation and manage that the institutions support recording, we won't have one of the main components that we need for the infrastructures, which is a taxonomic backbone. And many of those lists that are called authoritative are authoritative until some point but are not authoritative regarding completeness in many cases because the people do their best effort but they have just a number of hours per day and of volunteer time and available time so until we don't support with salaries recording jobs we won't have complete taxonomic backbones and we need this for all these sorts of infrastructures including citizen science yeah. and i don't have a solution so <laughs> carlos that's a great point and it, you know it, it speaks to the need of the infrastructure and also the capacity and expertise of taxonomists and that there is a growing need to increase training programs to continue that important work. Very good point, Carlos. Thank you. Well, uh, we need to we need to say goodbye and let the other people on for the closing ceremony. So I thank everybody for par participating, and once again, invite you to join us in um, November, November eighteenth. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks.